I don't think I've ever spoken in front of this many people in my life before. I'm <laughs> terrified. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how I got here. Uh, I was asked to do this, and, I, and I'm really happy to do it. But uh, <clears throat> this, is the, uh, th this is really not urology. I'll, I'll try to throw a few plugs in for urology here and there. But um, what, what I really wanted to talk about and, and what I think is really really important is um, just, you know, <laughs> I see this in my practice. I, I really think that we have an epidemic of, of sickness in, in our country, in the Western world. Um, and, and people, there <laughs> our expectations of what your health should be, I think, have been really lowered. Um, and, and what surprises me, uh, is how easy it is for, for people to have really, really excellent health, but there, there are some huge uh, obstacles to overcome. So the topic of the talk is avoiding and eliminating modern diseases of affluence through whole food, plant-based nutrition. I'm John Huffer, um, and as Linda alluded, I'm a urologist, and uh, I'd like to thank Michelle for having me here too. So uh, I, I am not a professional researcher. I'm not a nutritionist. I, I did, when I was trying to get into medical school, I worked in a uh, nutrition research lab at the University of Colorado in Denver. Uh, we worked in, uh, we, we did stable isotope studies uh, studying the absorption of zinc uh, in the human digestive tract. But um, professionally, that's about all I've done and uh, put a few small, uh, like, technique papers out. Um, so none of this is, is any of my original thought. None of, none of this is based on any of my original research. Um, I'm just a guy who's really, really interested in, in nutrition. I seem to always have been really interested in nutrition. I think it probably started, I went to undergraduate at University of Colorado in Boulder. I took a nutrition class way back then, and um, you know, Boulder's kind of a, a loose community, and, and there was a, a lot of that kind of thing, you know, vegetarianism, veganism, um, you know, going on. So it's, it's kind of been with me through the years, uh, but I, I haven't really um, practiced, you know, personally, uh, sort of what I think is heavy duty, excellent nutrition uh, until the last, say, seven or eight years. Um, I, I read about nutrition all the time, and uh, you know w what I have to say here is, is what I think is is the truth. Um, I kind of you know approach this topic with the attitude, you know, what is the very best way that I, as a human being, can eat, and I try to approach it with a, a very open mind. I mean, if the answer is eating a Philly cheesesteak, you know, I'd be the first one on board. But it's not. It's not. Um, and w one thing I'd say, though, is that uh, you know it's it's a real privilege working as a physician because um, it really you know it, it's a unique position where you're you're just going through you know hundreds and thousands of patients. I've got like twenty thousand patients in my my electronic medical chart database, and. Um, I mean, you see all this, all these diseases coming through, and, and, and you get, you understand people's attitudes and things. And I mean, I think there's a real disconnect between, you know, uh, what's happening in society and, and and what what people are capable of. And and it's a it's a really multifaceted, um, complex issue. Um, and I, I don't have any ties to any uh, industry or financial interests, anything like that. And uh, I, I thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I thought I was going to be talking to maybe Dirk, but <laughs> um, <laughs> or Chris. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, you know, th this is a wonderful, wonderful community. Um, we we came here. We're, we're coming up on nine years, and um, you know, everybody's just opened their arms, and uh, it just feels really good. I'd like to uh, thank uh, you know. The, the people at Fairbanks Memorial Hospital, I, I was brought up here on a uh, hospital support agreement, and that really 
helped me get established. Um, they're competitors, but I like to uh, thank the Surgery Center of Fairbanks too. I think it's a, it's a great uh, it's a great institution, and uh, you know these are the entities that allow me to, to practice medicine. So I, I feel a lot of gratitude towards both of them. Um, and uh, you know, to all the patients, I see you know a few out in the crowd. Uh, you guys are wonderful. You guys have been really good to me. Um, these people have no, no idea that I'm saying this, but I'd like to thank uh, Michael Hambage, Nancy Krebs, and Jamie Westcott. They're the ones I used to work with at the Center for Human Nutrition. Uh, my family and, and my wife especially. This is uh, the family. Oh, man. <laughs> Alex must have done that when I wasn't looking. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, very simple message here. Um, many modern health problems can be improved or cured by changing the foods you put in your mouth every day. And, and it just surprises me uh, how, many, how few people are aware of that. Um, there's a, a growing field in medicine. It's, it's called lifestyle medicine. Um, it, it's still uh, a minuscule aspect of, of how we practice medicine, but it, sh it should be the primary aspect of how we uh, practice medicine. I mean, the experts who, who look at this kind of thing as a profession, the professional researchers, I mean, they estimate that 80% of the disease processes that, that people suffer from and that we as, as doctors and healthcare providers um, treat are pretty much eliminated through nutrition and lifestyle. So, I mean, that, you know, and I, I think it's probably true. I mean, even 80%, even if it's only 50%, I mean, that's a staggering number. And you think about the amount of money that we spend and the resources that we're wasting. I mean, you know, yeah, a lot of people would be out of, out of work if, if uh, everybody was healthier and we didn't have such a mega health system. But I think everybody would probably be better off and we could be doing other things. So... Um, <clears throat> most modern medications that people are taking are given because of disease-causing foods. Uh, most modern medications do not resolve the conditions that they're intended to treat. They just sort of mask the manifestations of the conditions. And, um, you know, the experience with this is just huge. And it surprises me uh, how little this is publicized, but... Uh, most medications become unnecessary. They become unnecessary and dangerous and, and you know, counterproductive when certain foods are avoided or eliminated and replaced with unprocessed or minimally processed plant foods. Um, <clears throat> so the best way for human beings to eat is what is often referred to as a whole food plant-based diet, whole food plant-based nutrition, plant-strong nutrition. Uh, it is the optimum diet for human health. And there are decades and decades of uh, research, of evidence uh, to back this up. <clears throat> so um, we have, you know, Large studies, uh, they're historic studies, you know, cohort studies, uh, population-wide studies, epidemiological evidence, uh, historical observations, <clears throat> uh, massive clinical experience uh, that spans decades, um, published studies that indisputably show that a lot of illnesses just definitely get better when people start changing the way that they eat. And, you know, this is becoming uh, more and more common for people to, to run these kinds of studies. They're just building off of their, their predecessors. But, you know, th this kind of thing was known about, in, you know, in the early 1900s. Um, and even, you know, back in the 1950s, I mean, we knew that you can make type 2 diabetes just go away just by eating the right food. And then um, there's a lot of interesting scientific bench work. So, you know, when I was thinking about giving this talk, I thought, well, you know, what's, what's the best thing I can do? The 
the, the facts, the statistics, everything, I mean, there, there's just literally, you know, 10 Alaska ranges of, of this stuff. There, there's just too much. It's overwhelming. Um, so I, I just thought, well, I, I think the best thing I can do is to encourage people, if you're interested, to look into this yourselves. And uh, so that's really what I'm going to do. There are a lot of pioneering people who uh, are working in this area that um, that's kind of the point of my talk is to expose you to these people and the, and the topics that, that they're uncovering. Um, so aside from, you know, all, all the science, clinical experience, blah, 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 um, if you don't believe any of this, you know, and you've got some health conditions, try, try it yourself and, and you'll see, you'll see. So I read about this all the time. I, I listen to podcasts, all kinds of things. Uh, the scientific data, it clearly, indisputably, shows that for most people, the diet for optimum health is the whole food plant-based nutrition. While it's true that one size does not fit all, you know, we're all a little bit different. Some people can take one medication and experience no side effects. Other people uh, will have severe side effects. Uh, we all metabolize differently. And there have been studies showing that, you know, people will eat the, the very same food and and for you know, some people, it'll cause their blood sugars to spike. It might raise their cholesterol. Others, it'll, it'll lower it. Um, but those differences are generally pretty minor. Um, still, the, the overriding picture is that a plant-based diet is the best way to eat. Um, so <clears throat> there's a couple words that I, I'm not that fond of. One is the vegetarian diet. So, you know, a lot of times, uh, let, let's say a guy comes in the clinic, it's like, you know, doc, my thing doesn't work too well anymore. You know, what, what can I do about that? Well, mo most guys, they, you know, they want some Viagra, and that's fine. And, you know, what I really want to tell them is, you know, heart disease starts in the penis. It does. And if, if you're developing erectile dysfunction, you know, that's a sign that your cardiovascular tree is compromised. So, you know, most guys, they probably just want some Viagra and, and to get out of there. That's okay. I'm all right with that, you know. Uh, but, you know, I'd really like to talk to them about, uh, you know, this is a sign that, that your nutrition for years and years and years has been compromising your, your vascular system. Um, so they say, well, what do I got to do? I say, well, you know, you probably eat a lot of uh, meat and dairy and you probably have a lot of oil and probably have a lot of refined carbohydrates in your diet. So, you know, you got to cut out the meat and dairy. You mean I got to be, become a vegetarian? No. If you're a vegetarian, you're eating dairy products. And, and those things are really, really toxic. Well, you mean I, I got to be a vegan? Uh, no. You don't have to be a vegan. I don't like the word vegan because, you know, a vegan diet is not necessarily a healthy diet. I mean, you know, you can eat nothing but Lay's potato chips, and that's a vegan diet. <laughs> um, and I'll talk about it a little later, but, you know, probably the healthiest people in the world, they don't completely shun meat or, or dairy products, but they eat very little of it. And so I think that the best data shows that uh, a diet that is at least 90% minimally processed whole plant foods, and no more than 10% of it from meat, dairy, or you know, highly processed food uh, is, is the best way to eat. So, but the key point is little meat, dairy, eggs, oil, or simple sugar. What about olive oil? Olive oil is, you know, it's not that good for you. It's, it's, it's an advertising campaign. So if you want excellent health, a whole food plant-based diet is mandatory. Um, you know, you hear a lot about, uh, well, you know, nobody's ever talked to me about this. Um, you know, why doesn't, why didn't anybody talk about this? And, you know, I know my, my medical colleagues, you know, I love them to death, but, you know, some of them hear, hear about the way that I talk to patients sometimes about nutrition and, you know, they're, uh, 
silly. That's it's cute, you know, but it, it's, it's silly. You know, a lot of people just don't appreciate the incredible power that whole food plant-based nutrition has to make people healthy. Um, and for those, you know, who are interested in something like this, there's uh, very little to no support from the medical industry. Um, personally, I think our modern paradigm for the practice of medicine is insane. I mean, you know, the, the way that we have started eating, I mean, it has changed so much over so little time. Our bodies are not built for this. And, you know, pretty much everybody that I see over a certain age is on some kind of medication. And, and it's fascinating to me that, you know, every day, like 10 times a day, I'm, I'm seeing a new patient, you know, Mr. Jones or, you know, Mrs. Hitchcock, uh, do you have any medical problems? Oh, no, I'm pretty healthy. Okay. Have you ever had any surgery? Oh, I've had this, I've had that. Any allergies? Uh, yeah, you know, penicillin when I was a child, that's, that's a common one. Uh, what about medications? Uh, let's see. Um, I'm on uh, metformin and glipizide um, for my diabetes. I take uh, lisinopril for hypertension. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm also on, on uh, metoprolol, you know, and, and they start lift, listing off these medications, and it's like, oh, I thought you said, you know, you were healthy. I mean, you know, I, I don't say anything, but it's like, th that's what I'm talking about, is it just re doesn't register with people. And, and, and we've set the bar so low. Um, and, you know, using uh, lifestyle medicine is just not currently an integral part of the accepted medical culture. Um, there is a widespread lack of knowledge and interest among doctors, and this causes a dismissive attitude. And, you know, the reason is because it's not taught in medical school. Only like one third of medical schools have any nutrition curriculum whatsoever. And you know, there's like, there was an interesting event in California where you know, some people sued the state, or uh, sued the state medical board you know, to get nutrition into the curriculum and, and the, you know, the medical board like opposed it. <coughs> okay. Um, and, you know, we, we can pick on doctors, but, you know, physicians, assistants, nurses, and, and other medical people are included, too. And it's not, it's not a criticism towards people. It's just that this is just not widely uh, broadcast. It's, it's just information and culture that is just not widely disseminated. Um, there's, no, there's no morality to it. There's no, you know, intelligence or stupidity. It's just, it's the way it is, but, you know, I think the paradigm ought to change. Um, it's definitely not taught in medical school or residency. I mean, some of the worst eating I ever did in my life was in medical school. I had a really good diet, you know, when, when I worked in the nutrition lab and, uh, you know, I went to medical school and it's like, oh, the, the drug reps bring you pizza every day, <laughs> you know. Uh, and in residency, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's terrible. Um, more importantly, uh, you know, nutrition is not te tested on the United States medical licensing exam, so there's really no incentive to know about it there. Uh, it's not on any specialty board exams unless they, they may have a, uh, um, a lifestyle type uh, board exam, I'm not sure. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is probably, uh, you know, <laughs> patients aren't filing enough lawsuits, and, and one, of the, one of the guys I'm going to talk about here later, he, he wrote a book, his name's Joel Furman, he, he wrote a book called The End of Heart Disease, and I mean, in his book, he says, you know, if, if you go see a cardiologist because you've got chest pain, um, and, and the cardiologist says, well, you need a stent without telling you, you know, did you know that thousands of people have taken up whole food plant-based nutrition and reversed their disease and, and they don't need a stent? I mean, his point is, you know, you should, you should get sued. And he's probably right. <laughs> so, um, and then there's, su there's such a big thing these days, ooh, we're practicing evidence-based medicine. No, we're not. You know, the, the evidence is that people get really healthy when they eat whole food plant-based nutrition. 
and you know we're just we're just spinning our wheels. We're just you know chasing our tails. Um, I'd like to make a special mention of Dr. Wren. He's a cardiologist at uh, Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. He, he's the only doctor I know of in Fairbanks um, who really actively advocates th this kind of uh, therapy. It is therapy. It's, it's a drug. Um, I spoke with Dr. Cobbin, he's a local orthopedic surgeon about this, and, and I mean, he jumped on board, and I was really impressed by that, you know? Um, oh, I need to make a public apology to Charles Newberg, local radio uh, host. He had me uh, scheduled for an interview about this talk uh, Friday morning, last Friday morning, like 8 o'clock, and uh, I, I looked at this text at 9 o'clock, it's like, so you're scheduled for 8.05. <laughs> so apology to Charles if you're here. Um, and then finally, uh, Scott Looper, he's, a, he's an, a naturopathic doc here in town, and he's had me on uh, a radio show a couple times over the past few years. I was actually on it. He no longer does it. He's just moving on to other things, but he had me on his last uh, broadcast. Um, but, you know, really, uh, there's very little of this um, going around. <clears throat> so our health is getting worse every year. Um, cancer rates have been climbing steadily, at least from about 1915 to 2005. They may be leveling off a little. Uh, but, um, you know, Richard Nixon declared war on cancer, you know, whenever he was in office, in 1970 or something like that. And, um, you know, <laughs> we've spent billions and billions, billions of dollars and, and cancer is winning. Um, cardiovascular disease and hypertension is the norm. And again, Mr. Jones, do you have any medical problems? No. Well, what kind of medications do you take? Oh, I take a beta blocker, you know, I take a hypertensive, you know. Uh, it's, it's the norm. Like, people just think, well, this is how we grow up and this is what happens to us. No, it's not, it's not the norm. And, uh, you know, I think everybody knows we're, we're inundated with, with this news all the time. Childhood diabetes, adult diabetes, adult obesity. These rates are soaring. Um, luckily, there are some spots of hope, but you know, in general, these things are, are getting out of control. Um, and, you know, infections are common, and, uh, you know, part of this is, is the food industry. I mean, just like dousing our food supply with antibiotics and breeding superbugs. So it's, it's not only how people eat, but it's how we produce food uh, also that, that's a real problem. Um, people aren't, aren't as active either. <clears throat> and, and again, our standards, are, our, our bar is, is pretty low, I think. Um, so, you know, this is a really, really complicated issue. Um, and there, there are many reasons why. And it's a, it, it is our problem. You know, it's not, you can't blame any one uh, person, any one group, um, any one country. <laughs> you know, it's humanity's problem. But, um, you know, from the personal standpoint, uh, people are very comfortable with their identities, you know. We like to love ourselves and, and we like to be who we are and love that and honor that. Um, so, you know, most of us, I mean, I grew up in a household where, you know, I was making ice cream sundaes, you know, at night and eating hot dogs and chicken and burgers, you know, pizza. God, I drank ga gallons and gallons of milk. Um, you know, so many of us are growing up that way, um, but it's, it's actually, it's a toxic food environment. Um, but that's what we're familiar with, that's our culture, um, you know, and, and depending on kind of which uh, subculture you come from, most, uh, most modern cultures are not really practicing good nutrition. Um, a lot, of, a lot of times you talk to people about their nutrition and, you know, face it, the, the food that you eat uh, gives you the building blocks that produce the cells that produce your body and your food is you. And, you know, I start attacking your food. It's like, it's like a personal assault on you. 
So, you know, people get really personal about this. They, they get touchy about it. And, uh, and it's, it's amazingly emotional. Um, you know, I look at these blog sites where, you know, some of these practitioners I'm going to be talking about here in a minute, you know, who are really, they're trying to do humanity a favor by, you know, bringing this to light. And, you know, you got these internet trolls who are, who are just like lambasting these people, you know, and, and calling them liars. And, you know, why is that? There's also a very powerful uh, socio socioeconomic forces at work here. Um, you know, it is a fact that um, industries, you know, the meat, dairy, uh, big agriculture, uh, and, and junk food industries, I mean, they're very powerful. And they've got a lot at stake. I mean, you know, they're humans too. And we've all got the drive to survive. And so, you know, they're doing what they can to influence public thought so that they can sell their products. Uh, they're, they're trying to influence public policy. And they're even trying to influence uh, the direction of research and the findings of, of research. And that this stuff is all well documented. Um, and then there's a certain amount of narrow-mindedness, you know, and, and when I'm in clinic, I mean, <clears throat> when I really first started getting in this about 2010, and I got to credit Dr. Zuckerman with that. I, I was having Dr. Zuckerman over for dinner, and we, we had salmon, you know. It's like, Jeff, have, have some salmon. Nope, not having any. I said, well, why? And so he told me, oh, you know, I just read this book called Prevent and Re Reverse Heart Disease. So he talked to me about it, and I said, hmm, okay, so I'll read it. So I read this book, and, and that's, it's, it's been this way ever since with me. Um, but, uh, you know, when I first learned about this, I was fascinated. And I thought, my God, there's so many conditions that are just so nebulous, there's no cure, there's no treatment, there's no effective treatment, and all of a sudden it's like, well, there's so many things you can treat. You know, I was so excited. Started talking to people about it all the time, you know, and I think I really turned people off, you know. You get too evangelical and too militant about it, you know, and, and so I, I really, I've learned to tone it down because really it's just a waste of air in most cases. But I do find that there is a lot of narrow-mindedness about it. And, and you know, in clinic, um, you know, when people ask me, what can I, why am I making these stones? What can I do to stop making stones? Well, you know, it's primarily a dietary issue. Um, you know, you need to eat the right diet. And, and I call it the hand. The hand goes up. Oh, I eat a good diet. You know, everybody thinks they eat a healthy diet. But I think what most people consider a good diet you know, is not a good diet. Why'd you get stones then? You know, why, why are you on these medications? Why do you have these, these problems? Because you shouldn't. Um, people have a fear, lack of knowledge, uh, and, and a lack of, of understanding of, you know, what is this? I mean, is this like a communist conspiracy? <laughs> they don't have any experience with it. And, you know, there are very few people practicing this kind of thing, promoting this kind of thing. Um, and there's a certain amount of unpopularity to it. And, you know, it's like, oh, you, you, you self-flagellating, you know, thug. I mean, you don't, you don't want to enjoy life? Well, yeah, I do, but, you know, there's, there's different ways to enjoy life. And so people are afraid they're going to get banished by the tribe, too. Whole food, plant-based nutrition is the most powerful, effective solution to most modern health problems. It's an unpopular message. But, you know, it's, it's not about morality. It, it's, it's our problem. It's not about religion. It's not, you know, a political thing. Uh, when I'm talking about it here with you, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to lambaste anybody. Uh, really, my point here is, you know, I don't expect 10% of you will go out and start doing this. I really don't, you know. I, I'm realistic about it. But, you know... For those who do, my point here is to point you in the right direction. And like I said earlier, there's not a lot of support in the medical community for people who want to do this. And also, there's not a lot of support from your social peers, from your, you know, 
from your tribe. There's not a lot of support because most people aren't into this. So it's, it's challenging. It's very challenging. Um, so disease is not inevitable. You have a choice. And, and it always amazes me how people think that it is inevitable. So these are the major diseases, heart disease, stroke, lung cancer, infections, smoking, uh, barbecue, colon, rectum cancers, Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, asthma, soreness, stiffness, arthritis, medications, high blood pressure, heart disease, dementia, stroke, all of these problems. Oh my God. You mean all of these things are related to diet? Yeah, you bet. It's inevitable, right? We're getting older. It's just part of aging. It's a normal part of life. No, it's not. <clears throat> so how do people who are interested, and if you're not, no problem, but if you are, you know, more power to you. Uh, it does. It takes, in this setting, it takes self-motivation. And what's really important is self-education. And, and you have to read widely because you see so many things that, that are contradictory. And you need to find sources that uh, are very steadfast in trying to pursue the truth. Um, and it's, you know, if you're interested in doing this, it is a lifelong learning process which is very worthwhile. It's not like you just convert overnight. Now, if you're sick, if you're really sick with disease and you start doing this, I mean, you will. You'll see very, very rapid changes. And in fact, you'll see changes so rapid that it can be dangerous. And so if there's anybody here who's considering trying something like this and you're diabetic or you're hypertensive and you take medications, you need to do it under close supervision from a physician. Because if you start eating this way and you're taking diabetic medications, you're going to drop your sugars through the floor. Or if you're taking hypertensive medications, you're going to drop your pressure through the floor. You know, you got to go easy because it's so powerful. Um, you have to have an open mind to do it. You have to be open to it. You can't say, I already know everything, you know, there's nothing more for me to learn. Those people who do this, you know, they're just stinking liberals, you know, <laughs> hippies, <laughs> communists. <clears throat> just, you know, open mind. Uh, you got to be committed to a lifestyle change and you got to understand that there's going to be opposition to what you do. There's going to be, you know, people who try uh, to tempt you to get off the path. Oh, just have a little bit here, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to hurt you. Um, you know, I, I eat this way and I go through that all the time, even under my own roof. <coughs> uh, like I said, you need good sources of information. And, you know, if it seems, if you want to do it and it seems overwhelming, just, you know, you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to jump off a cliff. Just, you know, take one step at a time. And that's why, you know, there are people who you know, have initiatives like the Meatless Monday. I mean, you know, big deal. Just don't eat any meat on Monday, you know, to start. Or, you know, jump off the cliff. <laughs> but just do it. <clears throat> so, like I said, I've been doing this probably for seven or eight years now. Um, and, you know, I thank Dr. Zuckerman for uh, introducing me to um, prevent and reverse heart disease, because that got me started on this path. When I first came to Fairbanks and started practicing, you know, what I do is very stressful. Um, you know, you do a surgery on somebody and you got trained to do this thing and you can do the same surgery a hundred times on different patients and 99 of them, you know, go perfect and, and one of them, you know, you screw up or the patient has a complication for some other reason and, and we sit there and just beat the crap out of ourselves, you know. Um, or, you know, I, I'm just like, I'm just so stressed for time. But when I first came up here, 
I mean, my blood pressure was like, you know, I'd be in the PACU and I'd ask the PACU nurse to take my blood pressure. It's like 170 over 100. I was like, whoa. You know, and I was a little heavier. <coughs> um, and that was in, you know, that was in 2008. And a couple of years later, and you know, it was like that for a couple of years. And a couple of years later, you know, I, I got turned on to Dr. Esselstyn's work and, and uh, you know, I was just amazed, and it's, it's, uh, I, I'm just so grateful that I found that. But why do I do it? <clears throat> I do it because mainly I want to be there for my family, uh, not only just physically, but, I, you know, I want to try, try to stay uh, mentally intact. And, you know, dementia, I mean, more and more the research is showing that dementia and, like, heart disease are one and the same. Um, but there's some amazing research going on about this uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a little later. Uh, I don't want to get a heart attack. I love to run, um, you know, and, and when, I, when I go running, um, you know, I push myself really hard. Like, you know, sometimes I do intervals. And uh, what I try to do is, is get so that when I finish, you know, it's like every cell in my body is just sucking for air. It's like, <gasps> I need some oxygen. But, you know, if, if you've got compromised vascular tree, it, it's easy to give yourself a heart attack, and I don't want to do that. So, you know, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Ornish, uh, Dr. Furman, these guys, they, they, all, they will swear that you can be heart attack proof. So I try to be heart attack proof. I uh, don't want to get dementia, I don't want to get cancer. You know, the, the link between cancer and nutrition is also indisputable and, uh, and totally underappreciated. Uh, for not only for prevention, but if you end up with cancer, I mean, there's amazing studies just showing the power of nutrition to fight cancer. And it's, it's probably, you know, I tell patients uh, in urology, I think the most powerful thing you can do is, is change the food that you eat. And, and we'll talk about that a little later, too. Um, I don't want to get arthritis, okay? Uh, don't want to get infections. Do I get infections? Yeah. I mean, I got a tooth abscess a couple of years ago. That was terrible. But, you know, I used to get three or four colds a year, and now I get like one every, you know, year and a half or two years. Um, I mean, I've really noticed that. It's because I try to eat according to Dr. Furman's uh, plan. Um, yeah, I don't want chronic pain. I get patients in all the time. Yeah, I got this pain. It's like, okay, let's get a CT scan. Well, CT doesn't show anything. Um, yeah, but it's just killing me. You know, what is it? What is it? I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's probably your diet, but, you know, I'm not going to say that because you'll think I'm crazy, but it probably is. And there's millions, not millions, there's thousands and thousands of stories of people with just chronic pain who make this change and it goes away. I mean, it's true. <laughs> um, degenerative, bo degenerative bone and joint disease. Um, you know, stones, uh, I look at CT scans all the time. You look at people's, you know, their, their vertebral column, they got these little projections coming off their, their backbones, you know, their, 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 uh, their bone density is, is, is really thin. Um, you know, this, this diet is terrible f for bones, too. Uh, I don't want to take medications. I want to be active when I'm old, and I want to, you know, enjoy my retirement. And, and you hear so many people saying, I don't want to retire. You know, Joe Blow retired, and he was dead one year later. So these are a, a few of the authors that, if you're interested in this, I would recommend you check these guys. Um, I, I think that probably my very favorite is, is Joel Furman. Um, I left a little stack, I'm sorry, it was like 15 of these. I, I printed off these authors and uh, some websites and stuff. Uh, you know, I had no idea this many people were going to come. So um, maybe if, if you got a neighbor with one of those things, you could use your phone, take a picture, you can take a picture here, whatever. But these are some of the people. And, and this is kind of by no means a, uh, a, a thorough list, it's just scratching the surface. And uh, I, I think if you do one thing, <laughs> go to foodrevolution.com and every year they have a Food Revolution Summit and they, they interview several 
uh, leading edge experts in, in these areas and you know, amazing interviews. The interviews are conducted by uh, John Robbins. Does anybody know who John Robbins is? So he, he was the, anybody ever heard of Baskin Robbins ice cream? <laughs> he, he was the heir to the Baskin Robbins fortune. Um, his, his father started that company and um, John Robbins, he walked away from it. He went to Vancouver Island, lived off $500 a year for a while and he wrote Diet for a New America. He wrote uh, Healthy at 100, I don't know, some other books. Um, a really amazing guy. And by the way, his father became a, a, a vegan, you know, because he had a, a heart attack and um, had, to, had to heal himself. So, um, so John Robbins uh, gave birth to Ocean Robbins, his son, and, and they conduct these interviews. And they're really worthwhile listening to. Um, <clears throat> so... I call this the number one buzzkill in Western civilization. And, and why do I say that? It's because I think most people, you know, they, uh, whether you go to college or not, or, you know, you, you, you work, you're a teenager, you graduate to your 20s and 30s, you know, you work your butt off, and then, um, you know, you get to this more golden age, 40, 50, 60, you know, and you're like, yeah, I did it. You know, I, I did it. I'm feeling good. And then all of a sudden, Ugh! So about 610,000 people die of heart disease in the United States every year. That's one in four deaths. Um, it's the leading cause of death for people of most ethnicities, including African Americans, Hispanics, whites, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Asians, Pacific Islanders. It's second only to cancer. So it's huge. So this is the book I was alluding to, Dr. Caldwell Esselstein. Very interesting guy. He was on the uh, Olympic rowing team, you know, just super overachiever. He, he was an uh, endocrine surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, you know, just a, a, a big deal. This is probably the ER. Oh, sorry. Hey, honey, I'm giving my talk. <laughs> yep, I got to go. Bye. <laughs> okay. Can't ignore her. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so this guy, um, this guy was a you know hardcore surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, um, and, but he had some disease in his family. I mean, just read his book. You know, he he tells you the whole story. He had some disease in his family. He said, "Hmm, what can I do to improve health care?" You know, studied it intensively and said, "Hmm, well, you know, the societies where people have no heart disease, they have cholesterols under 150." I think she's calling me again. Oh no. <clears throat> um, so uh, so he basically, you know, decided that, uh, you know, if we want to try to uh, treat heart disease, we need to try to emulate these cultures, these societies where we don't find heart disease. <clears throat> um, and he points out, he calls. Cardiovascular disease, the paper tiger, a paper tiger. It's a toothless paper tiger that need not exist, is what he says. Cardiovascular diseases claim more lives than all forms of cancer combined. 50% occurs as sudden cardiac death, so your first warning sign. Um, other manifestations of cardiovascular disease, you know, involve obstructive clots or, you know, massive hemorrhaging, but uh, an obstructive clot if it goes to the heart, it causes a heart attack. It goes to the brain, it causes a stroke. It goes to the lungs, it causes pulmonary embolism. It goes to the bowel, it causes ischemic bowel. It's all the same thing. It's, it's just this thing that goes whoop and it, it plugs up your artery. The tissue becomes dis, uh, um, <clears throat> ischemic. Uh, and this kind of thing is also responsible for, uh, for arrhythmias, fatal or, or non. Um, and so, you know, lots of people die from this without any warning. And it's estimated that, you know, a very small percentage of this is like genetic or mechanical anatomic. He says, my message is clear and absolute. Coronary artery disease need not exist. And if it does, it need not progress. And that was, that was the point of his study. 
Um, so we spend more, well, yeah, this is probably a couple of years ago, 250 billion on heart disease. Uh, most of it is just for temporary relief of symptoms, you know, stents uh, and, and, and the workup. Um, almost all interventions do nothing to cure the underlying disease and prevent its development. So his study, he recruited 23 men and one woman around 1985. And these people were kind of the worst of the worst. You know, they, he got his referrals from his colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic, you know, who said, uh, you can't have any more stanch, you can't have any more bypass. And he got a few others, like one of his colleagues was a, a 45-year-old surgeon who had just finished operating, and he was sitting in the dressing room going, oh, my God, my chest hurts, you know. And, and he found out he had really bad advanced uh, coronary artery disease. And so, um, so he took these people and he put them on a, um, a, a vegan diet, a healthy vegan diet. Um, and uh, I mean, he, he just showed remarkable results. He, he showed that you can reverse cardiovascular disease. You can, you can stop its progression. And you know, at the time, it was thought that you know, this doesn't exist. It can't be done. And even to this day, you know, after he, he proved this with his patients, even to this day, people still deny that you can do that. It's like, no, he, he did it, you know, and he's done it like after this, he's done hundreds and hundreds of, of more patients and studies and shown that, yes, it is repeatable. It happens. Um, use plant-based nutrition, re reduce cholesterol to under 150, and sometimes he used statins to, to achieve that level. Um, and uh, his rule was nothing but a mother or a face. Uh, if, it swim, if it swims or, or walks or flies, you know, don't eat it. No meat, poultry, or fish, no dairy, no oil, not even olive oil. And, you know, he, he goes into depth about why that is. <clears throat> uh, yes to grains, legumes, lentils, vegetables, and fruits. And there, there are some aspects of his diet that I don't necessarily agree with. I think, you know, uh, he may have let, let a little bit too much simple carbohydrate in there uh, in some cases, but <clears throat> uh, he, in his study, his original study, no requirement for exercise or meditation. He just simply wanted to show that the nutrition is what makes the difference. Um, and during his recruitment process, there were six patients that they just didn't get it and they said, there's no way I can do this. They gave him the hand, you know they wouldn't comply, so he sent them back to their cardiologist, but he comments on how those patients did uh, at the end of the study 12 years later when, you know, all of his patients had thrived and, you know, these guys didn't do well. <clears throat> uh, in his study, one patient died um, and from, from an arrhythmia, uh, but he showed these incredible drops in their cholesterol and uh, some, some pictures that showed that uh, their artery uh, occlusion had been reversed. And, and this was a big deal at the time. And then almost simultaneously, uh, Dean Ornish was, was doing these studies, UCSF. Um, same kind of deal. Uh, you know, this um, plant-based diet. Um, he was, he's really into the stress reduction, you know, meditation yoga, that kind of thing. So he includes that, but he pretty much showed the same thing. So these guys did, you know, two landmark studies, you know, kind of debunking the idea that, that, you know, everybody has to get coronary artery disease. And once you get it, you know, you're stuck with it. That's what, it, that's what people thought, but no, it's, you know, the earth is not flat. Um, <clears throat> So he's written, he's written some books, and uh, down at the bottom, the one Spectrum is interesting because, you know, in that one, it's not like, you know, black and white, you're either with us or you're not. He's, you know, it's like every, everybody's an individual, you know, do what you can, you know, <laughs> have a meatless Monday. If that's all you do, great, but he kind of approaches it from that angle. And he's got a good website, so I encourage you to visit that. <clears throat> Um, so Ornish was Caldwell's contemporary. Um, first, uh, he, he called his the first and only program scientifically proven to reverse the progression of heart disease. And, uh, you know, he and Esselstyn kind of famously 
uh, treated President Clinton, um, you know, with lifestyle medicine. And uh, Clinton, as far as I know, is still going at it strong. Clinton had a, a bypass in 2004, and, you know, of course he kept eating the same food, and of course he ended up getting a couple stents in 2010. That's what happens. That's what happens, you know. Uh, I just, I hear so many times, yeah, you know, uh, well, how, how's your cardiovascular, how's your heart? Oh, it's fine, you know, I had a heart attack, but I got a stent, I'm good now. It's, it's not true. <coughs> uh, um, Ornish's program was the first to be covered by Medicare, which is huge. Uh, and uh, Ornish has done some other interesting studies. Uh, he's moved on to other things. Um, he, he did prostate cancer studies showing that uh, diet, you know, can actually reverse low-grade prostate cancer. Um, and he did some studies showing that you can reverse dementia um, through nutrition. And uh, is it, does everybody know what telomeres are? So they're, they're the little um, caps on the end of your, your DNA, and they kind of indicate, you know, how much time you have left. So when they get short, your time is short. When they're long, your time is long, you know, barring a Mack truck or something. So um, he, he and uh, somebody else, I can't remember her name, but she got a Nobel Prize for it. They, they showed that adopting whole food plant-based nutrition actually lengthened telomeres. Uh, this guy is, is legendary, um, T. Colin Campbell. He wrote the China study and then a sequel called Whole, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition. Um, so he was a guy, uh, by the way, Esselstein grew up on a dairy farm. Um, T. Colin Campbell and Esselstein did a lot of collaboration. Campbell, he grew up on a dairy farm. His father had a heart attack. Um, he was, you know, gung-ho, like when he, when he was a young man, he was going to find a better way to feed the world. He was going to, you know, he was going to just pump out some animal protein and stamp out starvation. Um, you know, a very intellectually honest scientist, um, you know, he, he's earned great accolades in his career, um, but, you know, he, his research led him down this really unexpected path. How am I doing on, on time? I, okay, I gotta, um, <laughs> I gotta shut up here. So, um, so basically, you know, read his book. I mean, th through, his, through his studies, he found out that the most powerful uh, initiator and promoter of cancer known to man is animal protein. So he showed through Occam's razor, the scientific method, that you can turn cancer on and off like a light switch uh, by manipulating the amount of animal protein in the diet. Um, and, you know, he got flogged for this. He got flogged. And uh, his, his second book, Whole, talks about this, um, you know, professionally, like what happened to him. Really interesting. John McDougall, the guy's a legend, he, he's basically, uh, he, he had a stroke when he was a medical student because um, he just ate, you know, just garbage. And uh, he, uh, he started out as a, as a plantation physician and he observed on these plantations, you know, these, these Japanese, Chinese, Filipinos, it's like, wow, these old generations, God, these guys are healthy. They're like 90 working in the fields, and their kids are like, you know, fat and diabetic. What's going on here? And so he figured out, you know, oh, yeah, and I had a stroke. So he figured out that connection. He's practiced medicine, you know, for three decades now, um, promoting, you know, lifestyle. That's his wife, Mary. They've written a bunch of books. Uh, this guy's really interesting, David Perlmutter. Um, he wrote those books, so the, uh, the basic uh, really interesting finding that, that he has promoted is that uh, your gut sort of controls the inflammation in your body, and inflammation is, is a huge problem. Um, it's recognized as the basis for, you know, most degenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, MS, Parkinson's, as well as diabetes, 
uh, coronary artery disease, cancer, and according to the World Health Organization, it's the number one cause of death worldwide, causes more deaths than war, accidents, trauma, all that. Um, and so inflammation in the body is determined by the permeability or leakiness of the lining of the gut. And so the idea is, you know, you've got bacteria in your gut. Okay, sh should I? Okay, w what should I do? <laughs> okay, all right. If anybody walks out, I won't be offended. Um, so, uh, so these are um, these are little projections called villi, and this is a cross section of the intestine. And the villi are there to increase the surface area for absorption. And then upon these villi are microvilli, which further increases the absorption. And so. Um, uh, the, the microvilli have, uh, you know, cells. So if you look at it really close in a, in a microscope, you can see that you got cells, a single layer of cells kind of stacked next to each other. And those cells are joined by some things called tight junctions, gap junctions, etc. cetera. And um, the health or the, the, um, the integrity of that barrier, and you're really, when you're eating, you're taking the environment and passing it through your body. You know, your, your digestive tract is basically part of the world, you know, and, and everything between your digestive tract and your skin is, is you. And, and so um, your digestive tract is incredibly important for keeping the world out and, um, and selectively bringing in what it needs. So you have bugs in your, in your gut. They have to be there. They've been there for, you know, eons and, and you know, millions and millions of years. They're, they're incredibly important but you got to have the right kind of, of bugs. And um, that apparently is, is dependent on your diet, on the kind of foods you eat. And if you eat the wrong kind of foods, you get the wrong kind of bugs, and those bugs um, somehow cause the tight junctions to uh, become leaky junctions, and you got lip lipopolysaccharides, um, which are the covering of gram-negative bacteria that escape into your body, in, into your bloodstream, and your immune system goes, oh my God, there's an invade, and, and you get this inflammation. And so, you know, that's why people who just have this diffuse, vague pain, you know, I just heard all the time, I've got rheumatoid arthritis, I got arthritis, I got myalgia, I got tendonitis, I got, you know, that's why they hurt. They've got this leaky gut and this just chronic inflammation. Um, and so it's been found, you know, that this is a basis of all these d disorders. This guy's a, a neurologist, so, you know, he's studying brain diseases. And, and he's like, you know, this is what's causing these brain diseases, the gut. It's, to me, it's just fascinating. A healthy gut microbiome, that's the big buzzword now heals the lining of the gut, alleviates disease. And so, you know, you can read about those studies. Dan Buettner, um, he wrote uh, The Blue Zones, really interesting guy. Uh, when he was a young man, he, he, God, he bicycled like across Asia and Africa and, and all over, you know, probably from Alaska to South America, something like that. Um, but then he took on this project with uh, the help of National Geographic. And these guys did really meticulous uh, science, you know, to, to make sure that the people they were studying were as old as they were, you know, through, through uh, documentation. And um, they found these, uh, the, these five places where people live to be incredibly long and, and they avoid uh, these chronic degenerative diseases. And so they said, okay, well, what's their secret? And, and so, you know, to make a long story short, uh, one of the places was Sardinia, Okinawa, uh, Southern California, Loma Linda, um, Costa Rica, and um, Icaria. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and, and so they came up with the nine things that were common to all these cultures. And one of them is the, the plant slant, avoid meat and processed foods. And that's kind of where the 10% the thing comes in, you know. These people are not going, hmm, should I take a daily supplement? Should I go to the gym? No, they're just, they're just living their lives the way that they know how to live because that's how they live. 
they're not trying to find it, follow any special diet plan. That's just what they do. That's just what they know. But it just so happens that most of what they eat is, you know, minimally processed plant foods. Um, they eat meat once a week, maybe at the most, you know, usually like once a month just for a celebration or whatever. They may have a little bit of fermented yogurt or fermented dairy product. And, you know, a lot of them drink wine. Um, but, you know, they, they've also got very nice uh, close-knit communities. They've got very good social support. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, the basis of their longevity. And uh, uh, Dan Buettner has got this project going around the United States. He's starting to establish these blue zones in, in different cities. He's, you know, he's uh, recruiting governments. Uh, and, and local community leaders to establish blue zones to make changes and, and they've had some incredible success stories you know like stamping out childhood obesity or at least severely decreasing childhood obesity oh and, and one interesting thing um, that I've been trying to practice lately stop eating when your stomach is 80 percent full it's really interesting and you do that and it's like 20 minutes later you're like yeah god I am full you know if I'd kept going man I wouldn't you know packed and you should try it. Um, Michael Greger, he's another really interesting one. Oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, so he has a website called nutritionfacts.org, um, uh, which is, you know, I, I recommend just looking at it. It's, it's, it's entertaining. Um, but you see some, you know, he has this website, he says, because there's about 2,000 papers coming out every year, and he reviews these websites so that you don't have to. And he, he just makes little videos and makes these little vignettes that are really easy to understand. You know, yeah, it's, he puts a slant on it. You know, th this guy is a freak about, you know, plant food, uh, plant-based nutrition. But he is for a reason. His grandmother was one of the first Pritikin patients. Pritikin started a uh, plant-based nutrition uh, program in, I mean, it's like the 1970s. Uh, you know, and had incredible results, and, and his grandmother was one of the first patients, very, very sick lady, and she, you know, was expected to die within a year or two, and she ended up living, I, I think, like 30 more years. Um, so that was his experience that, that compelled him to become a doctor and compelled him to, to go into this, this area. Um, Interestingly, you know, he, he lectures all over the place. When Dr. Cobden got on board about, you know, plant-based nutrition, he's like, oh, we got to get, we got to get McGregor up here. Or not McGregor, I keep saying it, Gregor. We got to get Gregor up here. So he was going to bring him up, you know, and, and he charges like a $5,000 fee or something. But interestingly, he donates every fee he earns, he donates it to charity. He doesn't keep any of it himself. So he, this guy really, really walks the walk. Um, uh, so read this book it's interesting how not to die um, he talks about these 15 most common killers in the United States uh, he goes through all of them talks about the nutrition second part of his book he talks about you know what to eat how to fix it why you should eat it why it's good for you um, I, I get a lot of questions you know about fish oil if you will indulge me can I read something from his book about fish oil Okay, is fish oil just snake oil? Question mark. Thanks in part to the American Heart Association's recommendation that individuals at high risk for heart disease should ask their physicians about omega-3 fish oil supplementation, fish oil pills have grown into a multi-billion dollar industry. We now consume more than 100,000 tons of fish oil every year. But what does the science say? Are the purported benefits of fish oil supplementation for the prevention and treatment of heart disease just a fish tail? A systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Journal of the American Medical Association looked at all the best randomized clinical trials eva evaluating the effects of omega-3 fats on lifespan, cardiac death, sudden death, heart attack, and stroke. These included studies not only on fish oil supplements, but also studies on the effects of advising people to eat more oily fish. Are we going to get kicked out of here or what? <laughs> okay. You just tell me what to do, okay? What, what, did, um, what did they find? Overall, the researchers found no protective benefit for overall mortality, heart disease mortality, sudden cardiac death, heart attack, 
or stroke. What about, uh oh. <clears throat> You're gonna have to drag me kicking and screaming out of here. What about for someone who had already had a heart attack and is trying to pre prevent another? Still no benefit was found. And you know, he, he annotates these with the studies. Where did we even get this idea that the omega-3 fats in fish and fish oil supplements are good for you? There was a notion that Eskimos were protected from heart disease, but that appears to be a complete myth. And, and I was reading another source about this, and, and it's true. Some early studies, however, looked promising. For example, the famous DART, D-A-R-T, trial from the 1980s involving 2,000 men found that those advised to eat fatty fish had a 29% reduction in mortality. That's impressive, so it's no wonder the study got a lot of attention. But people seem to have forgotten about the sequel, the DART-2 trial, which found the exact opposite. Run by the same group of researchers, the DART-2 trial was an even bigger study, 3,000 men, but this time participants advised to eat oily fish, and particularly those who were supplied with fish oil capsules, had a higher risk of cardiac death. After putting all the studies together, researchers concluded that there was no longer justification for the use of omega-3s in everyday clinical practice. What should doctors do when their patients follow the American Heart Association's advice and inquire about fish oil supplements? As the director of lipids and metabolism at Mount Sinai's Cardiovascular Institute put it, given this and other negative meta-analyses, our job as doctors should be to stop highly marketed fish oil supplementation to all our patients. Iatrogenic, that means um, caused by, you know, health care providers. <laughs> and serious, it's serious. Stay the hell out of the hospitals because they're dangerous. It's a, it's, it's a, big, it's a big problem. Guys like Dirk, and you got to watch out for him. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Dirk is an excellent nurse. He's awesome. <laughs> He's a good guy, too. Um, well, <laughs> apparently, but I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to bring up um, Joel Furman here at the end. And, uh, you know, Furman, he talks about the long chain fatty acids, DHA, EPA, and, um, and actually cites some studies where some vegans have been found to be deficient in these uh, long chain fatty acids. Some people are able to manufacture them adequately uh, on a vegan diet, but others aren't. So he recommends, you know, either getting it tested or supplementing for these, uh, but he does not like uh, fish oil. He likes algae-based. So um, th this is a, a fascinating book that I, I recently finished reading, um, and, and I, I got onto this by listening to the um, foodrevolution.com summit. Um, so this is uh, a, a PhD who has made it her life's work to study patients who have survived cancer when everybody said they were going to die, okay? Um, and, and her question is, why aren't we studying these people more closely? It's like, you know, she just notes that, you know, it's like the medical establishment is just basically ignoring this, but, you know, they, they have probably something amazing to teach us. Um, so she wrote a book called The Radical Remission, Surviving Cancer Against All Odds. Um, and she says a radical remission of cancer occurs in the absence of Western medicine or after Western medicine has failed to achieve remission. Uh, her interest in alternative medicine began as a Bachelor of Arts student at Harvard, later became the sole focus of her PhD at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, in her thesis, uh, she traveled around the world, 10 countries, saw 50 alternative healers, and interviewed 20 radical remission survivors. And then after she became a PhD, she kept uh, working in this area, and she's talked to, you know, well over a thousand people now who, who have uh, survived cancer. And she's also started this um, radical remission project where, you know, she actually wants people to, to write in and, and say, yeah, I've survived this, or, you know, just contribute to that community. Um, so 
she, uh, in her studies, she, she mentions, you know, finding like 75 sort of general factors that a lot of these, you know, patients had, but when she ran an analysis on it, she was able to distill it down to nine common factors that all of these radical remission survivor people had. Uh, and, you know, she'll say herself, probably, you know, one of the single most important ones is radically changing the diet. The other ones were taking control of one's health, following, into, following your intuition, using herbs and supplements, uh, releasing suppressed emotions, increasing positive emotions, and you really should read her book. I mean, the, the things that, that they talk about are just fascinating. Embracing social support, deepening spiritual connection, having strong reasons for living, and as far as radical diet change, she says the majority of the people that I study all tend to make the same four dietary changes. They are greatly reducing or eliminating sugar. And she points out that cancer cells, you know, metabolize glucose at about a, a rate like 50 times higher than a normal healthy cell. And they're obligate uh, glucose consumers. Um, reducing meat, dairy, and refined foods, greatly increasing vegetables and fruits. Uh, eating organic foods and drinking filtered water, I, you know, I, I don't know if eating organic is necessarily true or not. What, what I've seen is, you know, yeah, there are definite benefits and probably, you know, all of our food should be raised that way, but conventionally raised crops are okay. You know, they don't have that much pesticide on them. Um, that's what they, they'll have you believe. Finally, uh, Joel Furman, another a really interesting guy former uh, world champion figure skater, uh, and he and his wife, uh, Lisa, they, you know, they were in the Olympics and they won some, you know, some big, big deals. Um, he's a board certified family practitioner who specializes in preventing and reversing disease using nutrition. He's like, Joel, he's like Dr. McDougall and uh, he's written a bunch of books. He, I, th I think his books are great. Um, I, I try to adhere to this guy's advice more than anybody else. He promotes what he calls a nutritarian diet. Um, and the basic idea is that for every calorie you eat, you should get the maximum amount of micronutrients. You know, he says, don't worry so much about the macronutrients, the protein, the fat, the carbohydrates. Don't eat simple carbohydrates, but eat lots and lots of complex carbohydrates, starch, uh, starch and fiber, you know, um, but uh, your immune system uh, thrives on micronutrients, and he wrote uh, Super Immunity, um, and, you know, I, I get a lot of uh, women in the clinic, you know, they get, they get sent to me because they're having urinary tract infections all the time, and, uh, you know, I, I've come up with this little list of things that, that I try to, you know, remember to tell all of them that, you know, hopefully it won't involve antibiotics, but um, one of them, you know, is, is, you know, as much as possible, try to eat this way, you know, and I don't really say, you know, stop the meat and dairy and stuff, but, you know, it's like just pile on the vegetables and the fruits, you know, um, and, and be kind to your gut bacteria because the urinary tract infections come from the gut and when your gut environment is benign, you know, you're going to have less urinary tract infection. Oh, and you should read McGregor's book. I mean, he's got a fascinating uh, story about tracing, uh, tracing E. coli bacteria from a women's health clinic where they're coming in going, oh, my bladder hurts, you know, and they get a urine culture and, and they, they check the DNA of these bacteria, and they trace it all the way back to the slaughterhouse wh where they had these chickens, you know, and there's like feces spraying all over the place. And then they, they find those same bacteria in these women's kitchens, like all over the cabinets and the sink, and all over the place. <laughs> oh, and another story. So um, this, the... Uh, this book, Fasting and Eating for Health, the last one there. His story was, uh, you know, when he was um, actively figure skating, I guess he injured his ankle. And, uh, you know, the thing was just trashed. And he couldn't compete anymore. 
And, and he went to all these surgeons. He's like, help me, help me. And nobody could help him. You know, he finally he went to this one guy and he said, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a needle and we're just going to stab your ankle like, you know, a hundred times and that ought to fix you. And he's like, well, I think I'll pass. So his father had gone to um, this place and I, I can't for the life of me remember. It was in San Antonio. Um, it was, a, it was like a, a medical compound, medical retreat where, you know, the primary treat, Sheldon, Sidney Sheldon or something, something like that, um, he, he would uh, treat people through fasting. And, and so Joel Furman, you know, after seeing all these doctors, nobody could help him, he went to this place and he fasted for 40 days, water fast only. And, uh, and, and his ankle got better. I mean, it, it cured his ankle, and he went on, you know, to, to be this great figure skater. And so, um, you know, for that reason, I mean, he's made this part of his practice is fasting. It's like, you know, fasting, he says that uh, if you really want to supercharge your health, you know, eat a whole food plant-based diet for three to six months, you know, just, just load up on those micronutrients. And then, like, you know, some people will go on this diet, and they may start out just obese, and, you know, it's like, well, they're losing two, three pounds a day, you know, and typical expected, you know, progression. I mean, it's just amazing, you know. When people are obese and they go on a diet like this, I mean, the pounds just, just shed away effortlessly. I mean, it's, it's an expected response. Um, but sometimes people are a little heavy, you know, they're like, the, the weight loss curve goes like this. And it's like, God, I just can't get rid of that last 10 or 20 pounds, you know. I'm still carrying it around. And so he, he puts people on a fast. He'll put them on, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 day fast. Has to be very closely medically supervised. But he also talks about how this is so powerful for uh, people to overcome autoimmune disorders like, you know, uh, SLE lupus, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, a whole host of problems. Um, so something interesting to try. And, you know, I read his book. And I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty wild, you know. It's like, how, God, I don't know if I could, you know, I tried fasting for like three days and it was, you know, it's, it's pretty rough like trying to live in the world and work and stuff while you're fasting. But um, my family, we went on vacation over spring break to Switzerland. It was last year or the year before. And, um, you know, I decided, okay, this is the only chance I'm going to get. I'm going to do 11-day fast. So, so, you know. I started like on Thursday when I was still working, so I fasted for two days working in clinic, and then we had the whole next spring break, and then in that week, and I fasted that whole time. And I gotta tell you, it was amazing. It's like you get through the first two or three days, and it's like, wow, this isn't so bad at all. You just, it's incredible. You just drink water, and you know, I got down to like 150 pounds, and I don't wanna be that thin, you know, but um, it's, it's not that bad. So what I like about Furman, he is heavily science-based. Uh, he's cured thousands of people with advanced diseases purely through aggressive nutritional intervention. You know, and anybody who, these days who says this stuff is malarkey, I mean, you're just not, <laughs> you know, you're just not looking in the right places or you're listening to the wrong people because, you know, these are just a few of these people who have, have shown this stuff and it is just so true. Uh, and he, you know, he's another guy who says you eliminate heart disease, not, not only reduce heart disease, you eliminate it. Um, aggressive nutritional intervention, he says, is about 100 times more effective at preventing and reversing heart disease than stents and bypass. And, and these weak dietary measures that, you know, conventional, like the American, uh, whatever the cardiology association is, um, He's also shown that diabetes can be eliminated by proper nutrition. And this is the thing that just kills me. You know, I see so many diabetic patients. It's like, you don't need diabetes. Diabetes is wicked stuff. I mean, that, it is wicked. You know, it is so bad. And you don't need to have it. And you can get rid of it in like two or three weeks. And we knew this back in the 1950s. And, I, you know, I remember seeing, like, posters. Oh, we're going to have a, you know, have a bicycle race, and we're going to raise funds, you know, to help pay for research to find the cure to diabetes. 
what? <laughs> we already know it. We already know the cure. Maybe not everybody can get cured. And there's type 1 diabetics. They can't be cured, but when they eat this way, the studies have shown their insulin needs are severely, severely reduced. Um, he, he, he talks about, he and Esselstein, they talk about the Mediterranean diet. Yeah, the Mediterranean diet was great, the Lyon study. I mean, they showed a reduction in risk of, you know, heart attack by, you know, 40%. But, you know, these guys are like, big deal, you know. We can reduce it by 100%. Um, so, you know, the Mediterranean diet, I mean, allows a lot of oil, a lot of refined carbohydrates, um, bad stuff. <clears throat> His thing is, uh, and, and this is one reason why I try to, find, I try to follow what he promotes, because he's got this acronym, G-BOMBS, and, and it's easy when you go to the grocery store. You just say green leafy vegetables, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, okay? And, and, you know, there are so many recipe books out there, so many recipe books. You know, you don't need to become a chef. I mean, the, the way I do this is I, when I have some time, you know, I'll make a few recipes, and I just learn some sort of general principles about what works, what tastes good. But, you know, overwhelmingly, like most of the time, I just wing it, and, and I love the stuff I make. You know, it's, I just, God, I'm, I, I have this love affair with the food that I eat. <clears throat> um, so, in conclusion, modern degenerative disease is widespread, it's growing, and it's accepted as inevitable and normal in our current toxic food environment. It is not inevitable, nor is it normal. It is uncommon uh, when you're eating good, nourishing food. Uh, whole food, plant-based nutrition irrefutably prevents, arrests, and reverses degenerative disease conditions. And uh, with the indisputable efficacy that's been demonstrated in clinical studies, uh, laboratory studies, um, epidemiological studies, the safety and affordability of lifestyle medicine, um, the modern medical establishment is pursuing an irrational course. And, and a lot of it is just, you know, it's run by, you know, profit. I mean, I am incentivized to keep you sick. I want you to get kidney stones. <laughs> I want you to have ED. How am I going to work otherwise? No, I'm, I'm not being serious. Um, but that's how our system is set up. Relatively few doctors, programs uh, support patients in making these necessary lifestyle changes. And, uh, it's, you, you have to educate yourself. It's not effortless, you know, it takes effort. And um, it, it can actually be lonesome, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, people may ridicule you, yeah, whatever. Um, whole food, plant-based nutrition is the most powerful protection against available, uh, the, the modern degenerative diseases. And I see a couple people here in the audience who are, are sort of living proof of that. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I, I commend you guys. You guys, it, you have no idea how happy it makes me to see you, you do this kind of thing. Um, would either of you like to say anything? I won't tell, say who you are. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, that's fine. All right, well, I guess that's it.